I usually begin poetry readings uh, with a poem by William Stafford. William Stafford uh, was a poet that won the National Book Award back in 1963. He was born in Kansas, uh, spent much of his adult life in the Pacific Northwest, uh, taught at Lewis and Clark State College most of his career. The poem's called The Way It Is. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. And uh, I often share with students in class that poem to say, you each do have a unique individual way of seeing the world. You have passions, you have potential or proclivities, but much of life is going to want you to ignore those things so you fit in easier, so that you'll be a good consumer and buy lots of things that people want you to buy. And so I'd encourage you to find your thread, hold on to the thread, uh, pursue it the rest of your life, because as Stafford wisely reminds us, yeah, people get old, they die. You're gonna get old and suffer. But the thread, the thread actually bears you up and makes it uh, worthwhile. You'll see, maybe ad nauseum, maybe to the point that you'll want to walk out the door, that, that I have certain threads. Um, the natural world is one of those threads. Uh, certain animal life, certain plant life, certain trees that I'll name over and over again in poems. Certainly the love I have for my wife, a woman that I've known since I was 12 years old, or our two sons who are now 19 and 16, but they'll show up in these poems at different points in their lives. Uh, the relationship I have with my father, the pursuit of the unknowable, the mysterious or the mystical uh, that we sometimes name as God shows up in these poems. So I'll tease out some of those threads tonight in the poems. So I'll begin with a poem called Doctrine because I am, uh, if, if, if I had to take a, a, a litmus test for a church, I would be branded a heretic, I'm, I'm guessing. So, doctrine. I love the church of the osprey. Simple adoration, no haggling over the body, the blood, whether water sprinkled from talons or immersed in the river saves us, whether ascension is metaphor or literal, because, of course, it's both. Wings crooked, all the angels crying out, rising up from nests made of sticks and sunlight. And I don't know if you've had a chance to see osprey nests. They're beautifully built. And of course, to see an osprey fly and hunt is a beautiful thing. Um, a poet who meant a great deal to me early in my life was Galway Cannell. I continue to read him. Uh, but early on, he sort of showed me a, a way that I thought I could maybe make some poems myself. Uh, and so uh, Galway is now 87 years old, uh, but if you want to read a mystical poem about hunting a polar bear, it's a persona bo a poem written in, in the voice of an Inuit, read the bear. And if you want a sweet poem about how kids always come flying towards their parents' in bedrooms and parents are trying to share a moment of sexual love, <laughs> read After Making Love We Hear Footsteps. It's a beautiful poem that Canel wrote. So this poem is called Letter to Galway Canal at the end of September. And here we are, right, finding ourselves at the very end of September. I confuse the name for goldenrod with the name for this month, but what else would we call this time of year? Afternoon light like saffron, blue lake reflecting blue sky. Where we entered, asters and goldenrod flooded the length of the meadow, field literally a buzz, swaying with the movement of bees, air warm enough to draw sweat and the smell of those flowers and our bodies drifting around us. The part of the sun that rested the kettle of heat upon the goldenrod's tiny yellow blossoms 
lifted the clearing clean out of the ground, somehow suspending us, if not in air, then in time. And that's what we want after all, not starting over, not being reborn, but born up like these bees or the birds who migrate toward a place of never ending. All of us unmoored, still part of the earth, but absolved of our obligations to it. The necessity of growing old, the bald fact that a month from now, all this beauty will crumble, asters black, goldenrod brown, no more than flower dust when we rake our hands across their heads. I don't know if any of you folks get melancholy about uh, this time of year, right? You know, uh, I don't know if any of you have trouble with light issues. Uh, I don't have any clinical thing. I'm not the sort of underneath, you know, ultraviolet light or anything, but boy, I tell you, when the days start getting short, and by the time I get to November, and I know I've still got to slog through to the winter solstice, and, and still, you right into at least the first week of January. Now, starting about January 10th, I start to go, yeah, I'm gaining, I'm gaining. And right, you gain light right up until uh, late June, and then you start that descent, but there's still so much goodness to go on in July and August, and the garden's coming to fecundity. So many of the wild edibles that I like to eat, uh, like black cap raspberries or red raspberries, or uh, later autumn olive, a non-native species, but a fabulous species to eat. Uh, and, and then suddenly I get to this moment. And I love these days, and they're some of the most beautiful days, but, but there's something, because of the mortality of the time of year, that it's about to slip away. Uh, so yeah, could we just stop for a moment? A moment of stasis. So I don't know how many of you know the uh, scientific discipline of taxonomy. It's how uh, scientists for about 200 years have tried to organize all the different species so that we can speak to one another across languages. Uh, it's one thing for me to call a black bear a black bear, right, an American black bear, but if I'm speaking to a colleague who maybe doesn't speak English, I need to say Ursus Americanus, and then we can both have a conversation about it. Carl Linnaeus, a, a, a Swedish man, began this discipline about 200 years ago. So this poem is called Taxonomy. We've been taken captive by the world, named by it, taught to eat from its table, the wetted blade slides through the flesh, thin veil that parts to reveal what we think is the soul. We set fires and burn the earth because berry canes won't come back without dirt as dark as the color of its fruit. Before the oldest trees were felled, we traveled the watercourse. Now in the open fields, we track coyote, hoping to save the sweet lambs we tend. Sadly, as night stumbles down, all we find are clumps of wool caught in Tiesel's fine comb. More than two centuries ago, Linnaeus began to arrange all the names we've given back to the world. This is how we know black walnut holes, when crushed, smell like lemon. Or when we walk through sweet fern, grouse will burst into flight, dragging the plant's sharp scent into the air. Near the stream, a tulip poplar blows down, leaves turning the yellow of mustard and ragwort. Despite the order we've cultivated, the charts we've set to memory, we're likely to discover our way is one of unknowing. When we die, may we be a pleasing word placed in the mouth of the world. Um, the final lines of that poem have many different meanings, but I always give a plug at poetry readings. Maybe poetry can make something happen. Think about what you're going to do with your body when you die. We have, again, all kinds of ways that there are industries, and I have several friends who are morticians, that they would have a great deal, deal to lose out on. But uh, many cultures put their bodies back into the mouth of the world in different ways. And uh, if we have some physics, fans out here, right? We have no more or less energy in the universe than when the universe began. It's just constantly being transformed. Your bodies can be transformed. The world's been feeding you since you were born. How will you feed the world? Uh, I don't know if you know, there are some um, 
places in the world where Tibetan monks actually cut up the bodies of the dead and place them on, on risers so that uh, the, the raptors, vultures, can come down and carry off the bodies. I think that sounds like a pretty brilliant way to send my body back in the world, but I haven't found a place in the U.S. that will do that. <laughs> so, so, you know, maybe somebody could start a business, right? Eco green business, right? You know, of sending my body into the air with raptors. I, I don't think we'll get by regulations on that one. So, uh, my family had a farm in the Berkshires of Massachusetts that my uh, parents retired to for a time. And so, this comes out of that place. It's called a consideration of the word home. Because glass is more liquid than solid. Because this pain made more than a hundred years ago ripples and bubbles, the prosody of its movement is like an epaulet of stars shimmering on a night in August when the first cool air is smuggled over the border and our vision of what we thought was the unchanging world grown fat with melons and the reddest peppers runs floorward and we spy our father strolling within the grape arbor dreaming of the first hard frost and the dark fruit that will turn sweeter as the vine dies. And that's one of the oldest themes we have, I think, in uh, art and poetry, right? That somehow our mortality makes things sweeter. That knowing that uh, we only have so much time brings things to a head. I don't know if, how many of you know uh, the Latin Dona Novus Pacem. Some of you may have sung that in church. Uh, and uh, right, grant us peace. And it's that evocation, Lord grant us peace, grant us peace. Well, if you've had children, if you've had cats, and if you've had trouble, Dona Novus Pacem. The moon grows from nothing to a porcelain sliver. The cat bloodies her feet against the screen chasing moths. Our children sleep in the rooms above while I drag a cloth across the red petals the cat leaves on the kitchen floor. I join you in the bed of this passing hour, knowing porcelain will again sift through the screen and again moths will flood to it, light cut by their beating wings, which come morning our children will find in pieces. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the book, uh, Last Child in the, right? Last Child in the Woods, Richard Louv. Uh, it's all about, and he coined a phrase, attention and nature deficit disorder, playing off of attention deficit disorder. But uh, I really like a lot of the research that's been done to show, you know, we're evolutionary mammals, and that you are wired to have connections to the natural world over millennia. And only in the last few decades have we slowly been, based on structures we create as humans, taking ourselves out of contact with the, the natural world, out of immediate contact. Uh, and so, Shelley, my wife and I, one of our big commitments were to raise our sons in, in a way that was similar to the way we were raised. Having, and we were very fortunate to have this, but having space in which we'd say, go, knowing, yes, there's always a risk. All your parents, a few folks that are sitting out here when they sit you off to college, they were all holding their breath, right? You remember when you first got your driver's license and begged your mom or dad to, to, to take the car? And they held their breath. There's always that danger, right? Uh, but our boys, uh, we, we had a, a, a wonderful river that ran behind our house, the little Juniata River, and we had over 600 acres of woods that a farmer owned that they could go play in. And yes, where I live, we have lots of black bear this year. We had uh, two different times this summer, we had to set up bear, bear traps for a couple of recalcitrant males that kept trying to get in things that shouldn't get in and displaying some aggressive behavior. We have bobcat, uh, we have coyotes, we have wild turkey and fisher and mink, uh, even river otter. Uh, and I can go on with the list, right? Loads of porcupine. So there's potential, we have timber rattlers too, lots of timber rattlesnakes, there's potential that the likelihood is small and what the boys gain in having that freedom and that exploration, and that's something Lou talks about in his book. Uh, more and more we're finding about how your brain grows too in that connection with the natural world, that act of play and discovery in the natural world. So 
I guess I kind of mean what I'm about to say in this poem. It may alarm you, what I, what I suggest at the end of it for my kids. It's called Seeing Things. A 300-pound bear wandered into our village last April and ended up trapped by a crowd staring at him as he moved along the main beam of a maple in Mrs. Henderson's yard. The game commissioner drugged and tagged him, took his sleeping carcass deep into the woods. We don't have mountain lion anymore, so bear try to lie down with our children. On a logging road this past February, a bobcat leapt across the ruts in front of my truck. Purple afternoon with nothing moving, me thinking it might be the soul trying to escape with my breath. I wish I'd gotten out of the truck and walked in silence through the snow to see if this is how we're ushered into the next life. But I couldn't hold my tongue, and the cat vanished. The last few days, that same bear has roamed near the stream that runs behind my house. Hunger showed him the way back. He'll wreck our bluebird boxes, feast on the orange and gold carp in the neighbor's pond. The neighbor and I made a pact. We don't plan on telling anyone about the bear until he disappears with our children, and then only after the apple blossoms fly away. Um, I, I love painting. I wish I could have been a painter, but it's not in my skills. Uh, and so this painting is by Craig Bleeds. He's a Wisconsin artist. Um, the Miller Art Museum up in Wisconsin just did a whole 10-year uh, retrospective of his work, beautiful hardcover, oversized book. But I discovered his work in Michigan over in Saugatuck, Douglas. There are a lot of art galleries there about 12 years ago, and then stayed in touch with him. And I was so thrilled when I was able to use this painting. It's called Burn Barrel. And you see cows. He loves cows. I love cows too. My dad was a veterinarian, and my dad went to uh, University of Kentucky and was an ag major there and lived in the dairy barn. That's how he got his room and board and got to eat all the yogurt and cottage cheese and ice cream that he could hold. Um, and so this is an homage to some of the uh, dairy farmers that I've known, especially the dairy farm wives. And if you didn't know, there is a patron saint of cows. So you hear about the patron saint of cows here as well. It's called the Consolation of Wind. In the barn, as she helps her husband, her belly bumps against the worn wood of stanchions, the warm sides of cows whose udders are tugged by rubber and metal, whose milk runs the length of the barn in a maze of plumbing. She is tired and her back aches. She uses fistfuls of bag balm to ease the skin stretching, child kicking her insides as she shovels manure and hoses the dairy parlor's slick gutters. Like Perpetua, who was gored by a bull only to become the patron saint of cows, this woman is grateful for the neglected beauty of bovine, fullness of breast, width and curve of haunch, the strength of sloped shoulders, the heavy eyes that watch for the consolation of wind as it rubs the limbs of lilac and dogwood. And this is how clueless I can be sometimes. Um, you know, I forgot to set my stopwatch so you wouldn't be here forever, but I'll do that now, coaching me. Um, I never thought about the fact that, right? I'm comparing a woman's beauty to a cow's beauty, and somebody might take offense at that because I, son of a veterinarian, I, I think cows are gorgeous, uh, and, and I think a, a pregnant woman is beautiful. And you know, here's this dairy farm wife, and I thought she's just absolutely stunning and radiant. And there was a review of the book in the Green Mountains Review, and uh, the reviewer was from New York City. And so, and, and she brought up the poem, and I thought, oh my gosh, I am about to get skewered. And she said, Davis actually means it when he compares the beauty. I thought, oh, thank you for being gracious and not <laughs> saying I was this awful misogynistic pig that uh, was, was doing the worst, calling a woman a cow. Because in my mind, that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I use poems for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, to celebrate beauty that I see. Two, to capture moments in a similar way that a visual artist might, I don't want to slip away and, and become part of 
the air never to be seen or thought of again. Uh, there are limitations. We'll all be dust. All the books will be dust someday. But at least for this moment, I capture it for a while longer. Also, to work out things, including what should I do as a dad when certain certain issues uh, uh, come to the fore. So this poem literally was written when my son was in sixth grade, and he came home. And he started to tell this story about a classmate whose father had died while cleaning his gun. And I, I am a hunter. Uh, I hunt for a range of environmental reasons, uh, including what healthy meat for my family. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, it's a hunting culture. And my son already at 12 knew, you don't die cleaning your gun. Uh, and then Shelly and I, you know, we didn't say anything to Noah at the time, but Shelly and I knew the family and that suicides ran in the family. Uh, depression ran in the family. And so uh, I, I sat down and, yeah, the poem has gone through some revision since then, but it was one of those real gifts of a poem that came out pretty fully formed. Uh, and I read it to Noah the morning before he went off to school, trying to say, maybe here's something that you can do. So, uh, how do we teach mercy to our children? The poem's called Accident. They tell the son who tells his friends at school that the father's death was an accident, that the rifle went off while he was cleaning it. I'm not sure why he couldn't wait. We understand the ones who decide to leave us in February, even as late as March. Snows swell, sun disappears, Hunting season ends. With two deer in the freezer, any family can survive. I know sometimes it feels like you've come to the end of something. Sometimes you just want to sit down beneath a hemlock and never go back. But this late in the year, when plum trees have opened their blossoms, Yesterday, it was so warm, we slept with the windows open, smell of forsythia right there in the room. I swear you could hear the last few open, silk petals come undone, a soft sound like a pad sliding through a gun's barrel, white cloth soaked in bore cleaner, removing the lead, the copper, the carbon that fouls everything. My son knows you don't die cleaning your rifle. The chamber's always open. I told him to nod his head anyway, when his friend tells the story, to say yes as many times as it takes, to never forget the smell of smoke and concrete, the little bit of light one bulb gives off in a basement with no windows. Within the uh, Christian tradition, we, we have the idea that we're created in the image of God. Jewish tradition as well, and other sacred traditions around the world. And so the, the Latin for that, right, imago Dei, in the image of the deity, in the image of God. Uh, sometimes I look around and I think, no, nah, not so much. Uh, <laughs> so here's a little argument with that theology. Imago Dei. The weasel who lives along the water's edge splits the muskrat's vein, jugular blood stringing the back of the head. Mouth shut until death's jaw hinge opens the throat so tongue may lap warmth and salt. What's left of the idea we were made in the image of God? Stomach red with joy, ears raised to guard against the approach of another. Like the muskrat, our flesh comes undone. And like the weasel god, our bloodlust is lost in briar or beneath the dirt roofs of these muddy dens we call heaven. And so I have all kinds of arguments. I think I told uh, the poetry literature class I went to visit about this poem. Um, within the Jewish tradition, there's something called Midrash. And Midrash is when the rabbi, as well as other people, write into the space where the text seems to have confusion, <laughs> mystery, or even gaps. And so uh, within the Gospels, uh, Jesus is walking along, and I am a tree lover, a true tree hugger. Jesus is walking along, and he's hungry, and he comes to a fig tree, and he doesn't find figs on it. He touches it three times, 
causes the fig tree to wither. You know, you hear about all those wonderful miracles, right? People that are dead being brought back to life, people with leprosy, right, being touched and healed, you know. And woo, yay, Jesus. And then Jesus goes and kills a fig tree just because he's hungry. And the fig tree doesn't happen to have fruit on it. I really had a bone to pick with Jesus. So, <laughs> so this poem's called Midrash, and, and it's where I'm trying to write into that text and figure out how, how in the world does Jesus do this? So, and it has an epigraph from Nikos Kazantzakis, uh, the uh, Greek author who wrote uh, St. Francis of Assisi in The Last Temptation of Christ. And so here is his quote. And the heart of man is a green leaf. God twists its stem and it withers. Midrash. At first, the hunger in his belly did not burn, nor did it lie at the bottom with the heaviness of stone. It was like iron hammered flat, like the dull edge of a knife pushed against a whetstone. Because hunger leaves no one alone. As he passed a fig tree and found green leaves but no fruit, he touched three limbs and the tree withered. This did nothing to sate his hunger. And like dead wood catching fire, where there had been no heat, a blaze erupted, ravishing the air until he could not remember the taste of honey and bread, the pungent bite of apple skin, and his scorched tongue hung from his mouth like a stray dog no one will care for. Those who followed asked why the fig tree must suffer, why the flames of punishment instead of love had fallen like a falcon from the sky. Silence was the only answer, and soon they slept by the fire. In his dream, he gathered from the dust stones the size of figs and ate until he was full. He awoke to the sound of water moving in a riverbed, the sweet drone of bees flying among poppies. In the early dark, he went to the river's edge and drank deeply, dousing the fire that had burned all night. He then sent his disciples ahead to a village where the sick lay on cots, their flesh like dates laid too long in the sun. As he made his way to that village, he departed from the road to find a place that was hidden. And there he shot out fig stones, covered them with dirt and blessings. In that place, two trees sprouted and bore fruit. Of this, he told no one. And I hope you weren't shocked when Jesus shot. You know, we all know Jesus wept, but maybe you didn't know Jesus shot. I, I don't know if you know, literally, many medieval theologians came up with, and these were Gnostics who wanted to deny the sacredness of the body, uh, and literally said, Jesus didn't pee, didn't urinate, didn't uh, have a bowel movement, and on and on and on. And, and there's a delightful poem. I mentioned Galway Canal. Galway Canal, in a book called Imperfect Thirst, has a poem called Holy Shit. <laughs> and he means it. I love that he means it. And he starts about the first three pages of the poem are just quotes about shitting throughout the history of literature, including some that deny Jesus ever did this. And then Canel breaks into this beautiful poem that says, it's wonderful that our bodies are such miraculous, organic uh, you know, machines that you take in food, sustenance. It leaches out minerals and vitamins, and then it moves through you without poisoning you, and then you can drop it onto the earth. And if we take good care of it, it can enrich the earth once again. I know you're all like, my gosh, I will never go to a poetry reading where somebody is so enamored with, with our, our bodily functions, but I am. And in fact, I wouldn't even be a poet if it weren't for the horsewoman, Maxine Kuhlman. She was a horsewoman in New Hampshire. And I'm the son of a veterinarian, so I did a lot of kennel work, right? Uh, taking care of sick dogs, awful, which always smells awful. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, slant on. <laughs> anyway, um, and I discovered Maxine's poem, the excrement poem, which is all about her mucking out stalls. And here was a woman that had won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry with a poem called the excrement poem. She also has another beautiful one called the grace of geldings in ripe pastures, which is all about these geldings, uh, you know, out in pasture eating and eating until one of them slowly has to 
to return nitrogen to the earth. I'll just put it that way. And she writes about it so beautifully. So since we're on the topic of manure, I'll give you another manure poem. Uh, I, I read a lot of uh, classical Chinese poetry, stuff that was written you know, anywhere between 500 and, and 1,000 years ago. I'm, I'm grateful to many translators, including David Hinton, a wonderful translator of uh, these poems. And so uh, you're going to have some Chinese as well as Japanese poets show up in this poem. But this poem takes place in Amish country today. So I'm bridging a few distances. It's called April Palm. In the book that rests in my lap, Esau notes passing geese, Basho the scroll of clouds, the calligrapher's brush paints the dark edge of a spring storm, while Amish turn the earth, thud of draft horses' hooves, sound of plows striking stone, two women heads covered, travel by buggy to town where they will buy fabric for the dresses they sew. Somewhere behind the hill's shadow, Tufu laughs, draws a line in the dirt, composes a poem about cherry blossoms pitched in the wind, their petals clinging to fresh horse dung. In the West, we have real problems with the sacred and the profane. That's why we have all kinds of dualities between the soul, right? You know, and, and the body, the spirit, and the flesh, the intellect, and, and, and the flesh. Um, I think uh, the Asian world does a much better job of, of trying to say these worlds come together. How many of you know the myth of Sisyphus? Anybody? No, yeah, all the smart people, there's all the professors, and all the professors right, yeah, yeah, myth of Sisyphus. Okay, you guys don't know the myth of Sisyphus. Um, very crude retelling of the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus loved to mess with the gods. He closed down the river Styx. The river Styx is the way we get to the afterlife, okay? Karen takes us across on the boat across the river Styx to get to the afterlife. He closed down the river. There were people who needed to die. You know how you get old, you suffer, and death becomes a release at that moment. There were people that needed to die. And so Sisyphus got punished for being a very bad, bad boy. And his punishment was to have to roll a huge boulder, a rock, up the slope. And he'd always get right, almost uh, finishing the task. And lo and behold, it would roll back down the hill and he'd have to do it for eternity. So he shows up in here. Sometimes I think, um, we may all be rolling a boulder for a while with the way we treat the earth, uh, sort of following our own nest. And so this poem comes out of a place of incredible degradation. There are places where I live that, that are pristine. Um, I don't know how many of you know about native brook trout, but native brook trout are in Atlanta char. They got landlocked, land, landlocked uh, literally tens of thousands of years ago. So they're, they're related to salmon far more than trout, but they're called brook trout. They're some of the most beautiful fish, but they have to have the most pristine, clean waters. And it, it, these waters have to be very cold, spring-fed streams, and there's a, a particular ecosystem that goes with it, beech trees, hemlocks, rhododendrons that help keep this pristine environment. So there are places like that near my home, but there are also places up on the Allegheny Front where they did deep, model, deep tunnel mining for coal, uh, you know, and, and uh, strip mining as well. And so this poem comes out of uh, a place where I go with my sons to fish, and we would never eat the fish out of it, but uh, there's some amazing largemouth bass, huge largemouth bass, because they're a very tolerant species when it comes to pollution. They can have very warm waters, and they can have lots of uh, toxins in the water and still somehow survive. So it's called Fishing for Largemouth in a Strip Mining Reclamation Pond near Lloydsville, Pennsylvania. And Lloydsville, Pennsylvania now is one house in a wide spot in the road. But uh, back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, it was a booming coal town for strip mining. The gills rake down the sides of his head, and the mouth opens like the tunnels we used before the coal companies hauled in dozers and trucks to scrape away the mountain our grandparents had known. There was honor in riding rail cars underground, something mythic as fathers said goodbye to their children and traveled away from the sun. Our teachers told us the story of Sisyphus, and we understood how a stone might roll back upon the one who pushed it. Most of the tunnels are gone, 
filled in or forgotten, holes in our memory where the black line of money vanished like the wind that sweeps over the backside of the Alleghenies. As penance, the state made us dig out this pond in the shape of a kidney, water the color of liver, banks covered in cattails and loose strife. On the mounds of dirt that were left, goldenrod grows in thin circles like yellow mustard on bologna, the white bread of cloudy skies balanced on the horizon where red oak and hemlock should be. Black birch is the only tree that comes up, rises towards the sun's lure like a bass striking the plastic popper. My son dragged across the pond's surface, bait imitating a frog's ragged dance, enticing this fish he hooked and grips by the lower lip, both of them smiling or grimacing or simply trying to hold still for the camera. As I said, I do hunt for a range of reasons. Uh, in Pennsylvania, for example, there are more white-tailed deer now than there were 200 years ago. And whitetail, while they are beautiful, they're one of the most graceful animals you'll ever get a chance to watch, they're incredibly destructive to ecosystems. Uh, they can keep all kinds of forest regeneration from taking place. They can wipe out uh, all kinds of wildflower populations. And you have to understand, so many other species depend on all these other plants that these whitetail are, are wiping out. Um, for me, taking the life of an animal is a, is a holy transaction and something, uh, uh, I'm trying to think if there's ever been a deer I haven't wept over. And I always pray over the animal and ask that its life is going to feed my life. Uh, but it doesn't mean it ever gets easier. And then there are a lot of older hunters uh, that I'm friends with, and uh, some of them have stopped uh, hunting. They still go out. They go out with their camera. Everybody else has their rifles, and they're there to take pictures. But um, they say when it gets easy to take an animal's life, that's when you should stop hunting. Uh, so this poem comes out of that kind of an experience. Uh, it's called Hermetic, right? The whole idea of being sealed, Hermetic. The man walks into the woods with a rifle on his shoulder, <laughs> says nothing to the boy who has followed him there. For safety, the chamber is empty, bullets in the breast pocket of his jacket. After more than five hours listening to the sound of limbs with no leaves, they hear a deer picking her thin legs through windfalls and the striped canes of moosewood's last growth. The man presses the line of a finger to his lips, and the boy puts gloved hands over his ears as the noise of black powder and metal disappears. The woods dissolve into a different quiet than before, and the man tells the boy to stay in the stand while he goes to the animal's side. Because the body lies askew, he places her twisted legs beneath the torso, brings her head back to true, and before the knife relieves the body of its burden, bends to the hole the bullet has made, whispers into the growing circle of blood a prayer to be forgiven for all the things he cannot pray. Uh, a poem about my family. Uh, there are certain places in Scripture it talks about the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord. And uh, so this poem is written in the sense, uh, and, and I am a person that definitely, the pendulum of, of faith and doubt is always at play. So I don't want you to think uh, uh, these kinds of things are, are uh, without a lot of struggle for me to, to think about and write. But I thought, okay, if there is a deity, and it's a deity that looks down upon us and sees all things, what would he see? So the knowledge of the Lord. After the, after the first snow, the tallest stalks of goldenrod bend down in the far field. The wind and the sun the past few days have erased the snow, so you might be tempted to think the grasses and those autumn flowers had laid down of their own accord. Under the early dark, my boot grinds the dusty flower heads to see where they'll wait for next summer's heat. I like coming back through the dark when I can see you moving in the light of the window, setting the table for dinner 
or helping our sons with math. As we grow older, the field on windy nights sounds like the waters of a river come to a narrows. And that, that waterfall that we'll all tumble over someday. Um, you know, Amanda said about process, and it's true for me. I love the act of creation, and I love giving poems to people who have had meaning in my life. Um, and so that's something all of you can do. Uh, you know, that last poem, that's something that it, it did get published in a journal. Other people read it, so hopefully they connect with it on some level. But I wrote that poem for my wife, for the beauty that I find in her as I walk back in the dark. Because I often, uh, you know, as it starts to get dark earlier, I'll find myself out in the woods, sometimes an hour still in dark. And when I come back towards the house, right, uh, she'll be there because she's a much better tutor. I do all the cooking in the house, but <laughs> she's the tutor. And, and I'd walk, and, and right, she'd be illuminated, uh, almost like a gloriole. I don't know if you know that term from, from paintings of, of sage, you know. And, and she'd be illuminated in the light, and there she'd be working with our sons. And it would be this, I, I, I guess it's a bit voyeuristic, but I, I would take such pleasure in seeing her doing this. She didn't know that I was standing there, and there she is with love, uh, taking our boys to another place, you know, teaching them. Um, you all can do that. There are things that I'm sure you've shared with people that mean a great deal to you. Why not? And it's not a poem. Chop down a paragraph. Uh, Rebecca was telling me about a, a place in the, the Cascades where they have to write letters because they don't have access to computers. I'm an <laughs> avid letter writer, and I have some poetry friends who are, are dead set on saying, we're going to keep writing a letter. But if, if you're like, no, I'm still not going to write a letter, but mom and dad or your siblings or a lover or a friend has email, write a paragraph describing a moment that you shared with that person and send it to them. Uh, nobody knows what poem's going to last 50 years from now. I love the act of making a poem, but I don't know if any poems even going to last beyond my death. But the ripple effect of what you write and share with somebody in your lifetime, that's real. And that will continue to ripple outward. So uh, I told you, right, trying to, to sometimes get over hard things to deal with. My father uh, was my absolute best friend in the world. Uh, he lived to be 81 and a half, and so when he was 81, uh, he was a very fit man. We were still skiing at 12,000 feet above sea level in the Rockies of Colorado on double black diamond stuff above uh, tree line, uh, but he was having abdomen pain. He went home a little early in April, he usually would stay till May skiing, got the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer and was dead by July 25th. And my sons were still relatively young at that time, not that it's ever easy to grieve, but by trying to explain to your child why somebody has died. Uh, so this poem came out of that experience. Uh, there's a catalpa tree in it. You have catalpa trees on this campus, I already saw them. Um, it also has uh, my great-great-grandfather who fought for the Union. He was from Kentucky at Border State, fought for the Union, but was captured by the Confederacy and was in a prison but escaped. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I already told you I was a veterinarian, so you're good to go. So, what I told my sons after my father died. The emptiness of the catalpa flower's mouth opens into nothing. Stamen encased by cream. My father called it a weed tree. Despite his love for the light it provided in June, the colors it caught as dark came down over the garden we tended. The way he told the story, after my great-great-grandfather escaped from a Confederate prison, he traveled north by night along creek beds. He rested beneath the draped boughs of Catalpa, drank branch water, and ate pawpaws. Supposedly in dark's false stillness, he could tell the difference between a hound and a groundhog that in the water's hushed movements, he could pick out the stones breaking the surface of the stream long before dawn woke those who hunted him. In trying to explain the stillness, I don't wish to add to my son's sorrow. If I could play three notes upon a fiddle, I'd do that instead. 
When my first boy was born, in the nights after we brought him home, I stood above his crib, head pressed over the rail to assure myself he still breathed. I did the same when I was a kid working at the animal hospital. I'd open a cage, my ear flush with the chest of a dachshund or doberman, and listen to the heart after the strain of surgery as it settled back into a sound like a kick wheel turning clay. My father taught me the names for trees, which in turn I've taught my sons. That's what it was like after he stopped breathing. A bee disappears down the flower's mouth. Although we can't see it, the bee's still there. And I do, I still dream of my father. I've got a poem in my new collection called Dreams of the Dead Father. And uh, there are blessings and curses, right? Blessings and curses. I don't know, um, mostly blessings, I'm happy to see him. I like the, the, the dreams though, when, when he, he doesn't have to get sick before the dream ends. Um, I don't know how many of you have read Flannery O'Connor's short stories. I was an avid reader of Flannery O'Connor's short stories. Uh, at Goshen, I actually taught a chorus pairing Kurt Vonnegut and Flannery O'Connor, and it was so funny because the students, I thought they'd really enjoy Flannery O'Connor. My good peacenik students didn't like the Violets and Flannery's work because Flannery was a Roman Catholic who was born and, and lived in Milledgeville, Georgia. She went to the Iowa Writers' Workshop and then uh, had lupus and lived with her mother in, in, in Milledgeville. And uh, Flannery, uh, almost always had some extreme act of violence in her story that was leading to a moment where potential change could take place. Usually you didn't get to see the change, but potential change. In one, you do, do see a moment of change in which a convict shoots a grandmother in the head after having taken the rest of her family, they were on a trip to Florida, out to the woods to be shot one by one. So that gives you a little sense that Flannery was channeling Quentin Tarantino before Quentin Tarantino had been born. Um, do we have any Django Unchained lovers or Pulp Fiction lovers? Do not, I don't know. Um, so Flannery wrote this way. Uh, when she was young, though, she actually trained chickens. And a news crew came out. So this poem is based upon a, a real fact of Flannery's life. And it's called The Girl Who Taught a Chicken to Walk Backwards. I put a, a, a few uh, fictional things in here to make the poem work, but she really did teach a, a chicken to walk backwards. Mostly she loved hens whose necks grew too long, curved like gourds, crooked combs that toppled over the side of their docile heads. At school, when she was bored, she stared at the boy with the wrecked chest whispered in his spoon-shaped ears that it was easy to catch a hen and teach it to walk backwards, strutting, even dancing with an oblong gait. After the boy's grandpap ran over his leg, drunk and backing down the drive, he walked with crutches, later with a limp. In Ripley's, she'd read of a rooster who lived 30 days with its head cut clean off. She told him she worried about that chicken's sorrow, its grief at not being able to peck. She supposed the boy had to hide his secrets like a hatchet's head buried in a stump. Eventually all birds were beheaded, the family's cook grabbing the flightless bodies, thrusting them into boiling water, then plucking, plucking, plucking. Whenever the boy tried to speak, it sounded like a hen's clucking beneath the peach mustache, which was the same color as the sky at dawn when she coaxed her hens with meal, even molasses. <laughs> Instead of letting the birds aimlessly scratch, she'd shove her hands into apron pockets, thrust her head forward, and march straight as a newly plowed furrow, her stride narrow as the path to heaven. Upon her approach, what chicken wouldn't take a step back? The day the news crew arrived to film the bird, the boy came riding on his bike, hair standing up like wind in a coxswain comb, sternum like a chicken's breast sticking out from under his white pressed shirt. She took his hand because she already understood at some point 
we must take a step backwards to see whether we're frying in the fat of our sins or whether love, when we try to own it, must become beautifully misshapen. And just a couple more poems, and then if you have questions, I'd love to answer those questions. Um, yeah, I'm going to close with uh, two poems. As I told you, where I live, there are a lot of black bear, and I love bear. I actually have a, a totem in my house. I have a bear. Uh, you know, you've seen all the, the chainsaw art wood carvings of bears, right? And almost always I hate the way they demean what bears are. Because, right, they all look like they're friendly and, and sweet and, and uh, maybe it's somebody's grandma, you know? And and, uh, and I don't know if you know this, black bear really are a, a wonderful species. Uh, they don't want confrontation. Uh, sometimes humans, uh, if, if you have created a situation where there's food that they shouldn't be eating out. Sometimes that can cause a problem. Obviously, you don't want to get between a damn bear and her cubs. Uh, that could cause a confrontation, but otherwise, virtually nil. However, first time since the 1850s in New Jersey, just last week, there were four college students out around Delaware Water Gap on the Appalachian Trail, and one of them was mauled by a black bear. I haven't, I've been on the road, so I haven't done any follow-up research, because I just don't understand this. And sadly, the bear, of course, had to be killed. Um, because the story they tell is that the bear was aggressive and was chasing them and the four of them split up. And if you're ever in front of a black bear, please don't split up, stand together, get really big, wave your hands. Um, but one of the students then was later found mauled by the bear, but I'm just trying to figure out, because uh, sometimes we don't like to tell the full story of what we've done. And, and based on all my experience with black bears, I'm sitting here thinking, did they do anything to provoke the bear? Did they lay out any kind of food? You know, on and on and on. I, I, I hope that's not the case. I'm not wanting to damn somebody who died in a bear attack, but it just goes so against uh, the, the species' nature. I'm not talking about grizzlies. Grizzlies are a fairly aggressive species, <laughs> but black bear. Um, so that was since the 1850s, first death from a black bear attack, attack in New Jersey. They have a lot of black bear. Where I live, we have a lot of black bear. We have a hunting season for black bear, and every year, anywhere between 2,500 and 3,000 bear are taken every year. I don't hunt black bear myself because they are actually a population that will be self-managing uh, in the sense that uh, the amount of food that's available to them actually affects the litter size, and so they're self-managing, and I have no desire uh, to, to hunt that creature uh, because it's going to self-manage well. Uh, so. This poem is called The Poet Stumbles Upon a Buddha in Gamelands 158 above Tipton, Pennsylvania. And that's the village where I live. A young boar, Ursus Americanus, rests his rump on the pliable beam of a devil's walking stick, bending the tree halfway to the ground so he might claw black and purple pebbles from its crown into a mouth as large as a bushel basket tongue turned dark as the sweet scat he leaves in the middle of the path, a host of berries littering his belly, and his great head reared back in a grin, no concern for abundance or waste or for what comes after this early September light, which filters down through the yellow poplar leaves, wind making a sound like temple bells caught 70 feet up in the canopy. And so after many encounters with that with different black bears. Remember that totem I said that's in my office? I went to a, a friend in upstate New York in the Adirondacks who does chainsaw art, and I said, Will you please make me a bear that looks like a bear, actually, raised up on his haunches, and he did. And, and many bears literally have this sort of Buddha belly when they rise up on their haunches, and he, he got the Buddha belly perfect. And so it's a bear about this size, and it sits uh, you know, here's my writing desk, and here's the bear, and he looks over my shoulder as I try to write poems. So I'll send you off with a blessing. As I said, I'll be happy to take questions, uh, but here's the blessing or the benediction. How many of you know William Blake? Yeah? Good. There more of you that way. 18th century British poet, mystic, uh, wrote songs of innocence and experience. Some of you may know the lines, tiger, tiger, burning bright, right? That's William Blake. 
I like William because, yeah, again, not too orthodox and, and seem to be channeling something that uh, at times, and, and I hope all good mystics, I hope, are like this, but maybe they're not. At one moment, you're thinking, this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is bullshit. And the next moment, you're going, no, this is ecstasy. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing something. No, no, that was bullshit. No, no, it was, right? And, and uh, because it keeps you honest, it keeps you from drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, and I think it's important to stay honest and not drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, so this is a, a poem. The very last part of the poem is, is based on reported conversation that supposedly William Blake said to a boy that was sitting next to him at a dinner party. So here's the long title. I think it's my longest title yet. A prayer for my sons after a line of reported conversation by the poet William Blake to a child seated next to him at a dinner party. <laughs> so here's the prayer for my sons, and I'll say the prayer for you as well. If I could send the sun sprawling from my mouth, if each night the moon might drop from my eyes onto your head, if I could reach up and take a star whose light has traveled toward you for thousands of years and place it under the bed where you sleep, I would do all these things. But, being a man who has seen no angels and who at times doubts what he's been told in church, I'll simply ask what the poet asked. That God would make this world as beautiful to you as it has been to me. Blessings. sons after my father died and I'm one of these people uh, I remember what it was like to be in college and it's hard to buy a book right uh, sometimes hard to want to buy a book <laughs> but sometimes even when you want to buy a book it's, it's hard to buy a book so it's easy to find me on the web if you google Todd Davis and poet or poetry uh, one of my former students because this isn't me said Todd you have to have a website and he helped me make a website in January it has my email on it uh, so if you want to send me an email and, and like if you wanted that poem I'd be happy to send you a Microsoft Word document with the poem okay other questions yeah I, I know, I'm not sure I have a question I do but I don't know how to phrase it yet but um, yeah it, poems are definitely have less spirituality and, and nature in it and so what is your do you have a definition because i guess people can say yeah you write nature poetry <laughs> yeah and, and i'm laughing because who wants to be called a nature poet especially in the 21st century right. i'm a nature poet you know yeah yeah but sexy what <laughs> uh, uh, a, a nature poem if, if that's such a deep yeah. question you can answer. Um, I think it's the writer Robert Michael Pyle, who's a wonderful, uh, he's a scientist, he's a lepidopt, I won't be able to say it, Pike speech classes when I was a, a kid. I, I get tongue tied on certain words. He studies butterflies, it's a lot easier for me to say than lepidoptery and lepidopterist. Anyway, um, Robert Michael Pyle talks about saying, there's not nature writing, there's writing about the world, and then there's, uh, I think you know it's this long, and I'm not saying it correctly, but like uh, post-industrialized, uh, uh, urban, dysfunctional, blah 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 writing. Um, and, and I'm of that that mindset that you know we can deny nature, we can hide away in cubicles, we can look at our screens all the time. Nature doesn't go away. We can harm nature, we can foul our own nest, we can make the environment we live in uh, a place where asthma rates go up because of, of toxins in the air, we can make it so our groundwater is either undrinkable or we treat it and treat it with other chemicals and it shortens our lives. We can, we can do all kinds of things. What we can't do is escape the fact that 
nature exists and we are nature too. We're yet one more species. We're a species with a big brain. We can, if we want, make all kinds of very wise decisions about how we're going to live with the natural world that we're a part of. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, 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 and it's a great question. I honestly did struggle a little when I first started writing because I said to myself, this is all I know. And a lot of my peers were writing really hip, urbane stuff. And I'm like, I'm the son of a veterinarian. I spend all my time in the woods. Uh, and, and what really allowed me not to worry about it was to say, yeah, we're all gonna be dust. My poems are gonna be dust. And if that's the case, this is who I am. This is, this is what I think is the most real thing. And I'll write about it. Um, and I, I'm well aware, you know, I name lots of species in, in my poems. Uh, but I said to, uh, I, I may have said it to both classes that I met with, part of being a writer, you have to name the world constantly. And we walk through the world and there's lots of stuff we don't know how to, to, to name because we haven't learned it. Um, I walked through the world. So uh, somewhere down here along the, the library edge, along the forest edge, there's a beautiful clump of pokeberry. And as I walk by it, right, it's pokeberry. I don't sit there and go, stalk with some purple berries on, it's pokeberry. And then when I think of pokeberry, I think of all the uses that pokeberry has had uh, over its life in human history. And, and then I think, and look at it, it's ignored now. And I often think to myself, I wonder how many people pass the pokeberry today not actually taking a look at it. Because it's gorgeous and unique. It, it's funky looking. And some of the berries right now haven't turned purple yet. I wish we could all go down there and I'd show you. The design of the green berry and this white striping comes through that berry before it turns this dark, dark. It was used for ink quite often. Uh, and so then I think, wouldn't it be fun? To, I, I don't have a tattoo, but I know a, a lot of you have tattoos, right? But to think about and make a poem about Pokeberry and maybe, right? Uh, you know about henna and, and, and the, those kinds of tattoos, temporary. To think about what would it be like if we suddenly made a temporary tattoo on us of Pokeberry. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just the way I'm wired up. And so I've, I've decided, if somebody calls me a nature writer, I go, yeah, but it would be the same thing if somebody said, you're a Christian writer, I'd be like, no, I'm a writer. I happen to have Christian faith as well as other spiritual influences. I'm a writer. I happen to always be interested in the natural world. Huh? Somebody could call me a family writer, right? You know, because my sons, my, my dad, my mom, my wife, they, they show up in my poems all the time. No, I'm a writer. These just happen to be my obsessions, concerns, passions. So it's a great, great question. Yeah. This is more of a personal question, but is, are your wife or boys poets or writers? Today? My wife is not. Uh, she's a special education teacher. She has a, a, a BA and a master's in special education. Uh, my youngest son is actually a good writer, and I could see him actually becoming a comedian. He really is funny and irreverent. Uh, I didn't tell you that, Amanda. Nathan, she used to babysit for my boys. So Nathan's 16 now, and he can do impressions of anybody, and he plays with language all the time. He plays with the sound of language, uh, meaning and puns. I mean, and this isn't just dad being proud. I mean, he literally is a, a riot. Um, but my oldest son, Noah, uh, actually does write poems and fiction, and what's called creative nonfiction now. Uh, and I look at what he does and I go, this, you know, on one hand, right, I go, this is amazing, gorgeous. But the part of me that, it, and every writer has a little competitiveness, you know, and I go, come on, you're writing stuff I couldn't do before I was 40. You're 19. You're not supposed to be able to do that at 19. Um, so, yeah. Blessing or curse again, yeah, right? You know, hey, Noah, congratulations, you're an English major and you're writing poems. I really hope you uh, like washing dishes or waking up. So, the lucrative business. Other questions? Yeah. I'm just kind of curious, what's the biggest large round bass you guys caught out of that, Mr. Fine? That's a great question. And I didn't bring my, for once I left my computer at the hotel because I could show you. So what's the biggest? Eight pounds. <laughs> yeah, well, if you saw the size of the pond, because the size of the pond is about the size of this room. 
And so, and, and it doesn't get any deeper than this anywhere in the pond. And so, and there are uh, white crappie in there and uh, crazy, you know, sunfish, bluegill, pumpkin seed, you know, all that, but some nice large melon. I, I tease my sons that I'm going to start it because uh, they, they both, you know, one we call Nathan Bassmaster Nay, and, uh, and he, he has all kinds of lures and he catches bass like mad. And then uh, my other son is an avid fly fisherman, and I do it all. Uh, I, uh, and, and so, uh, but they're both sort of snobs now because of that, right? And so I sat and started a fishing show called Todd Davis Fishing with Worms and a Bobber. <laughs> and they're reeling the huge, large mouth, you know. I got a good one here on a night crawler. You know, <laughs> we're gonna get a sponsorship for night crawlers, right? <laughs> happens. Any other questions? You guys have been a lovely audience. I'll be happy to talk to anybody after, so. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure.